Uh, or they would love the United States to capitulate and leave the North Koreans be. In either case, they can point out how weak the United States is or how brutal the United States is. But I think one of the things we've learned in this is don't count on the Chinese to be the ones to solve the problem. And I don't think it's because they lack influence in North Korea. Uh, obviously they have it, but they don't want to use it. They were quite happy to see the United States bogged down in this. If I were the Chinese, I would be too. But what we've learned in this is don't count on the Chinese. They're not going to solve the problem. No, of course. Uh, Harry, do we want, does the rest of the world want Korean re reunification? I think that's an interesting question. I, I know the Chinese don't want that because they don't want in 20 or 30 years a powerful Korea that has, you know, factories that could be fueled by cheap North Korean labor meshed with a South Korea that builds things like Samsung Galaxy phones and has, you know, incredible technological prowess. I don't think that the, the Chinese are... are or a lot of countries probably in, in East Asia want that. I think eventually it probably will happen. You know, how that happens, I think, is one of the most interesting questions in foreign policy today. I mean, look, if North Korea collapses, we're, we're talking of a situation where, you know, we might have, Tucker, 60 nuclear weapons that are loose. We could have 5,000 tons of chemical weapons that we don't know where they are. So, you know, a, a, a staged sort of unification would be a great thing. But even that would be incredibly challenging. I've read different reports where it could cost as much as 10 trillion dollars to integrate South Korea and North Korea and take, you know, 20 or 30 years. So I think it's possible, but it, it, it makes this challenge look, look easy compared to, you know, reunification would just be very, very difficult. George Friedman, should the United States want reunification? I don't think it benefits the United States. Uh, our ally Japan would be horrified at that. It sees uh, North Korea is a potential adversary. It occupied it uh, before World War II. Uh, they don't want it. Uh, the Chinese may or may not want it to the extent they can control it. And I agree that uh, they're likely to oppose it. But look, this is a regime that survived when nobody thought it would. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell, followed by years of uh, starvation, uh, dysfunction, everybody was waiting for the Chinese for the North Koreans to go down. They didn't. This is a robust regime, not a nice regime, but a robust regime in the sense that it is well policed by the leadership and it polices the country very well. And this regime, one of the most important things they want is to survive as a regime. One of the reasons among several, they've built their nuclear weapons is to guarantee that no outside force is gonna come in and destabilize or undermine the regime. They haven't survived for the past 20 years uh, to be taken down. So I, th I think the real, uh, the real animosity toward a unification is actually North Korea. South Korea, as I said, uh, doesn't want to pay the bill for North Korean unification. And North Korea knows that if they unify, the regime goes down. And these guys are very happy with their lives running in North Korea. They have a strong self-preservation instinct. We should note that this is the president's motorcade, our president's motorcade. Uh, president Trump is apparently early uh, to the summit. Kim has not le left his hotel yet. Gentlemen, if you'll stick around uh, throughout the evening, I appreciate it. We're gonna go down to Mark Stein, who's been watching this unfold. Mark, you there? Yes, I am, Tucker. What do you, what do you make of this? I mean, this is not, if, if you had to make a, a list of predictions two years ago, this would not be on it, I assume. No, but President Trump uh, does things differently. This is a kind of uh, upside down summit in a way. Uh, it's going to start with uh, him and Kim just in the room together with no one but translators. That's really the opposite of the way almost any international gathering takes place. Uh, you know uh, the, the, the term, I think Churchill coined it, uh, Sherpas, uh, the people who map out everything the summit's going to agree. And then when 88% has been set in stone, then the leaders come in and, uh, and basically put the, their imprimatur on this. This is completely the opposite. Uh, Donald Trump is going to walk into that room and he's going to make his own calculation as to whether Kim Jong-un is there in good faith. And it's basically going to be the president who calls it, 
and decides whether or not this process is sincere and it's for real. And uh, that's very different from the way almost any other international summitry takes place in the modern world. What do you make of uh, this? Is that, by the way, we're, we're watching now the president's motorcade uh, in Singapore going to the summit site. Um, what do you make of the way this, this came about? I mean, I, I don't think it was anyone who predicted this. And it came no. out of the president's kind of signature bellicosity, which supposedly gets you nothing, but in this case did get us something. Yeah, and I actually think that's one of the, the, uh, the most effective things. You know, the weakness of the Western world generally is that when we uh, enter into talks or talks about talks, uh, these uh, third world dictators always understand uh, that our priority is to be in a room sitting down talking and getting an agreement and we'll do almost anything to get into a room and start chit chatting and having tea and coffee and cookies uh, with the third world dictator. The Iranians understood that for example uh, in their negotiations for years with, uh, with Europe and then with uh, the Obama administration and this is the complete opposite. Uh, uh, Trump's signature style uh, was basically to go uh, metaphorically nuclear on uh, the Pyongyang regime and then uh, when it was clear that he wasn't like Obama and other Western leaders uh, to offer the carrot of negotiation. And then just when, you know, uh, Kim was getting cocky uh, and he decided to start trashing uh, Mike Pence and John Bolton and all the rest of it, at that point uh, Trump yanked the rug out from under him. So this is a very different style and in a sense uh, the, the house trained Western leader is behaving as unpredictably as uh, the, uh, the third world basket case guy and that's a completely different style of negotiation. Whose motorcade by the way we're just watching uh, pass by. We <laughs> saw it a second ago they're heading to Santosa which apparently yeah. is Sanskrit for peace. There it is right there. Um, this is a man who does not leave his country very often. I think since returning home from boarding school in Switzerland, he's left only a couple of times, once recently to China by armored train. Kind of remarkable that he's left North Korea to come to Singapore for this. What do you suppose he hopes to get out of it? Well, you know, I thought it was very interesting when he was touring that casino last night. He's actually getting a glimpse of what almost every, I mean, Singapore is spectacularly successful, has won the highest GDP per capita in the world. If you're an old school imperialist like me, you think that's all down to Sir Stamford Raffles. Uh, and if you're of more recent vintage, yes, you think it was Lee Kuan Yew uh, who's done it since uh, 1963. But whoever you give it credit to, uh, Singapore is a hugely successful society. And so when uh, a dictator of a basket case uh, of a country